This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 313, recorded on November 28th, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today on this post-Thanksgiving episode from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. How you doing? I'm just fine. I'm home, as you can see. That's why, that's why we're doing this as a hangout. Yeah, you got to look up the weather. Yeah. Oh, oh the weather. It's cold. I'm home too. <laughs> yeah, here it's, it's uh, just above freezing. You guys. Yeah, it's one degree C. Other. We actually had snow devices. here. We had snow here on Wednesday. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. I guess yeah, you're pretty. cold out there, right? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty similar. It's uh, two Celsius uh, right now, but. Uh, we had snow two, uh, Wednesday, I guess it was, uh, really wet, mm. slushy, heavy snow, so I broke out the wuffle for the first time this season. Ooh, the wuffle! Yeah, yeah, <laughs> cleared off the driveway, it gave my shoulders a workout, um, got that done. How much did you have? Did you have a couple of inches? We got about, it was about three inches, but it felt like about eight as far as the weight was concerned, because it was just really, really wet snow. Hmm. By the way, I got 57 Fahrenheit and sunny. Uh, I didn't hear that. Did you hear that, Alan? No, no, I didn't hear anything at all. Uh, I only hear Rich's weather reports during hurricane season. <laughs> well, you know, I uh, I didn't go to work today, and that's why we're doing this as a hangout. And, uh, you know, the, the sound won't be as good as usual. And maybe it'll be a little lag, but you will have video. And you can see my viruses behind me. In my home office. Yeah, you really have a cool backdrop there, Vincent. It's not too bad. And it's the three of us today. Everybody else is cozy. A wall. No Dixon. Of course, Alan is. Alan's Alan went to work. You're in your office, right, Alan? Yeah, yes, he is. yes. I'm I'm in my office, and I, I don't have viruses for a backdrop, but I do have some uh, some preserved bugs and things like yeah. that. Uh huh. You I got like, all sorts of credentials back there too. Yes, yes. I I hung up my degrees about a year or so ago, and finally got around to that. I like your commute. Yes, I like my commute a lot. Yeah. Well, for today, I I have a great commute today, Friday, November twenty eighth. All right. Let's talk some. I commuted from Texas. Yeah, you, you flew back this morning from Texas, right? Yeah. Was and the, uh, as a matter of fact, I saw you guys on Google Docs. Did you see me on Google Docs playing with that this morning, do, doing yeah, with the yeah. agenda? We I was did. at 30,000 feet. Uh, right? what, cool. Yeah, that's cool. I like 30, doing that. 30,000 feet, editing Google Docs, connected to the server at work through the virtual private network. What a world. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's do some science. Okay. I got a follow-up. Last week's episode, if anyone remembers, was about noroviruses and how to grow them. Human noroviruses in B cells requires bacteria. So Stephanie Karst, the PI on that paper, writes, Hi, TWIV team. I'm so honored that you discussed my, own, my group's norovirus paper last week. I wanted to touch on a few points that came up and provide a bit more context. Regarding whether other RNA viruses are known to infect B cells in addition to influenza virus, as Kathy mentioned, rotavirus can also infect B cells. And she gives a link to a Journal of Virology paper describing just that. And this is rotavirus differentially infects and polyclonally stimulates human B cells. From Harry Greenberg. Ah. There you go. Who we have yet we have not yet had on TWIV. We keep threatening to do that. We will. Regarding why we would choose to use unfiltered stool as a source of virus 
knowing that there would be bacteria present that could contaminate our cultures, we already had evidence that commensal bacteria stimulated norovirus infections. We actually performed the antibiotic depletion studies in mice well before we began our human norovirus experiments. Based on the bacterial enhancement of murine norovirus infection in vivo, we decided to compare filtered and unfiltered stool as a source of human norovirus in our cultivation studies. So this is one of those situations where the story flowed better when told out of the order in which the experiments were actually performed. Okay. Isn't that usually That's the case start. though? Yes. Isn't, right? Yes, yeah. frequently. <laughs> as speculated during your discussion, we always use antibiotics in our media. When we perform the E. cloacae studies to rescue infectivity of the filtered stool, the bacteria were actually heat killed prior to incubating with the virus. Interestingly, heat killed bacteria do not appear to stimulate infection of the filtered virus in the cold culture system, suggesting that live bacteria are needed for the transcytosis process, but not for stimulating infection of B cells. I think that's the most interesting part of this whole thing. That the is. bugs have to be alive to get across the, the epithelial layer. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something you would predict. It actually, it actually uh, suggests that this whole thing is going to be pretty complicated because the, the histo blood group antigen all by itself will uh, promote the attachment to the B cells. Right. But that's not the whole story. Right. right. In order to get across the epithelium, you need live bugs. They must be, you know, they must be actively carrying the virus across the epithelium bound to the mm, histo maybe. blood group antigens or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And interesting Another that the question. bacteria are getting through the epithelium too. If that's yeah, what's happening. Absolutely. I mean it's supposed to be a barrier, right, in keeping yeah. bacteria out, but clearly there are exceptions, right? I wonder maybe. if the bacteria can do that without the virus there. Good question. Yeah, we I mean we're taught that right. that doesn't happen, right? All right, continuing. Right. Another but question maybe. that was Another question that was raised was how infection of immune cells residing underneath the intestinal epithelium could result in gastroenteritis. We don't yet have an answer, but can throw out some ideas we think about. One, infection of immune cells could trigger the release of pathologic levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines that increase the permeability of the epithelial barrier. We think this is unlikely, though, because norovirus infections are associated with only modest inflammation. Two, as discussed in the podcast, the virus could encode an enterotoxin similar to rotavirus. If this were secreted from the infected immune cells, it could act on the enterocytes basally. One correction, no one has yet proven that noroviruses encode an enterotoxin, but many features of neuroinfections are consistent with this pathologic mechanism. Okay. I didn't think so, and you know, you guys outnumbered me, so I figured you were right. <laughs> <laughs> you should know better than that. I should know better, yes. Number three, really hand-waving now. Is it possible that noroviruses bind, quote, non-pathogenic, unquote, commensal bacteria in the gut lumen and drive their transcytosis across the epithelial barrier? Some bacteria are non-pathogenic simply because they are unable to breach the epithelial barrier, but they could potentially be pathologic if assisted in this process. So maybe, maybe it's not so much the bacterium helping the virus across that causes the problem as the virus helping the bacterium across. Yeah. It'd be hmm. interesting to sort out. Yeah. A lot of interesting work to do. Yeah. All right. Well, it turns out, and yeah, we're going to have an Ebola update in a second, but we have another norovirus paper today because uh, it, it's a really cool thing, and I thought it would be neat to follow up with the second so while well, it's fresh in everyone's mind. Yep. And, and some similar questions are going to come up. But first... Uh, let's go to Rich Condit, who's going to give us an Ebola update. I just thought it would be nice to have uh, keep people up to date with this, in particular those who joined us because of uh, Ebola. It may be off the front page, but uh, if you're living in Africa, it's still an issue. However, there are some areas where it seems to be coming, uh, getting under control. And I'm looking at the uh, World Health Organization um, uh, situation report page. Yeah, 
And so there, as of uh, November 26, what's that, two days ago, there were 15,935 total cases, 5,689 deaths. So that's less than 50%. Uh, and if I scroll down on this thing, what interests me is the charts of the uh, number of cases reported on a weekly basis. And in Liberia, they are decreasing fairly dramatically from a peak of you know 500 per week down to now less than 100 per week. In Sierra Leone, uh, they look like, oh, I'm sorry, in uh, Guinea, they kind of leveled off at about 150 a week. Sierra Leone, they're still uh, either, it's hard to tell, could be on the increase, could be leveling off um, at about uh, a little over 500 per week. So if you put all those data together, it's leveling off or decreasing. I, they don't have a chart uh, of the totals. And in their little uh, uh, wrap on uh, highlights, uh, they talk about uh, uh, specific uh, issues that are being addressed. 70% um, of patients with uh, Ebola virus disease in Guinea are isolated. Um, and 80% of safe and dignified burial teams are in place. Uh, in Sierra, Sierra Leone, it's uh, fewer than 70% of patients are isolated and 25% of the required safe burial teams are in place. So uh, it is as if the um, uh, changes in the number of cases correlate with whether or not they have those measures in place, as Which is, one might predict. As one no might predict, yes. Yeah. At any rate, uh, it looks to me like uh, some of the grand catastrophes that have been forecast are not going to happen uh, if they keep this up. And uh, the measures that are uh, being taken are uh, having some effect. So that's all good news. Yeah. I think it's interesting that all of this is happening in the absence of vaccines or antivirals, which some people said would be necessary yeah. to curb this outbreak. And it just goes to show that you can yeah. make a big difference with just boots on the ground approaches, uh, which Jeff Shaman said some time ago to us, if you guys remember. Yeah. Yeah, and this is why a lot of diseases for which we don't have um, effective vaccines are not a big problem in countries that have effective public health systems. What did you? Is aren't you fond of saying that uh, toilets are toilets one of are the, the greatest public, greatest public health technology inventions? ever invented? Yep. Right. Yeah. Window screens are a close second. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's move on to a paper that we're going to do today, which is on norovirus. This was published in Nature not too long ago, and the title is An Enteric Virus Can Replace the Beneficial Function of Commensal Bacteria. And the authors are Kernbauer, Ding, and Cadwell, and they are from New York University School of Medicine in New York City. And as, as everyone knows, um, our guts, our bodies are covered with and full of bacteria, commensal bacteria, which help us out. There's also an extensive human virome, which we've talked about here quite a bit on TWIV. Now, the bacteria we know are beneficial, but we don't know if the virome is beneficial. Now, quite a long time ago, I think it was 2007, uh, Skip Virgin's lab published a paper showing that if you infect mice with a gamma herpes virus, it will protect them against lethal death caused by Listeria and Yersinia pestis, two bacterial pathogens. So he proposed at that time that some viruses are beneficial. So the idea that there are good viruses has been around for a while just getting the evidence for it has been tough. We covered that paper on TWIV, or at least we talked about it on several different occasions, but no one ever came up with other mammalian examples where the virome is beneficial. So that's what this paper is all about. This so paper is the smoking gut. <laughs> <laughs> smoking gut. 
Did you just come up with that, Alan? I just did, yes. It just occurred to me that this is kind of the smoking gun, and then I realized. Yeah. It's very good. Hey, maybe you should do stand-up. Right. Well, I'm, I'm really, standing up, I'm, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad I don't live in your head, Alan. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, on the other hand, it's kind of like Saturday Night Live all the time, right? 24 hours. <laughs> Alan, does does your family like tell you to cut it out, or you just don't do it? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> My wife just these out completely. She's she, they, they don't affect her at all. Uh, uh, we're lucky to have you on Twiv, <laughs> and this is being recorded for posterity, so your kids and your grandkids and beyond are going to see you, Alan. Yes, for anyway, them. Back to uh, bacteria and viruses. So uh, we've also talked on Twiv about studies of the gut virome. There are lots of viruses in our guts, including anelloviruses, circoviruses, these small single-stranded DNA viruses, and many, many others. And in monkeys, in particular, they have a gut virome. We did a paper also from Skip Virgin's lab, which showed that if you infect monkeys with simian immunodeficiency virus, the gut virome increases. So the virome is there. It's probably kept in check by the immune system. And is it beneficial or not? So that's that's what they address in this paper. Really important question. Now that they do here is they take um, germ-free mice, they take breeding pairs, male and female, and they infect them with norovirus. They use a strain that causes a persistent infection in mice. We talked about one of those last time. So these animals become persistently infected. They shed virus and they pass it on to their offspring who are infected and they pass it on to their offspring etc but these are mice are fine there's no sign of inflammation uh, in the intestine and they simply pass the virus on from one animal to another and germ free mice these are mice that have no effectively no normal bacterial contents in their guts that's They're... right so germ free mice can I wonder, if I wonder if they've got any other viruses that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure that they are virus-free, and that's obviously very easy to explore. Yeah. So they're raised in special barrier facilities and given special sterilized food and so forth that prevents them uh, from being infected with bacteria, but I don't know about viruses. And they're not particularly healthy. That's one of the things that indicates that the, the microbiome is important, is that these mice have kind of abnormal guts and abnormal. We'll talk a little bit about the immune cell development in them. As well. Yeah, so the mice can live without bacteria, but they're not very healthy. As Alan said, their, their intestine, their small intestine in particular, is messed up. They have thin villi. The crypts at the bottom of the villi are narrow. Um, th they have reduced numbers of granules and lysozyme and panith cells. This is one of the epithelial cell types in the small intestine uh, that secretes antimicrobial substances. And their T cells are really skewed. They have very few um, CD3 positive T cells, which is just a marker for T cells in general. They have fewer helper T cells and they have fewer cytotoxic T cells. They make less interferon, they make less antibody in the serum and in the mucosa. And all of this is because the enteric bacteria promote not only the proper morphology of the intestine, but lymphocyte differentiation. So this is something that's been known for quite a while now, that the gut bacteria uh, is important for this. Amazingly, these animals that are persistently infected with norovirus, the morphology is almost normal. Yeah. So they, they have these beautiful pictures, sections of the small intestines. The, the villi look almost normal, the crypts are almost normal, and the T-cell numbers are all pretty much close to the conventional mice. So somehow uh, the virus has allowed all these things to occur uh, as they would in the presence of bacteria. And the histology is kind of, um, it's got to be dramatic because I can see it. Right. Uh, normally I look at histology slides and I say, well, I'll just take it on faith that it shows what they think it shows because I don't see the difference. But these, you know, you've got a little thin, thin villi in the germ-free mice and then nice, thick, healthy ones in the conventional mice and nice, thick, healthy ones in the, in the norovirus mice. It's pretty dramatic. You know, it's interesting because most of the uh, changes that they report have to do with immune cells and the uh, immune response. And yet there's this one 
a histological change that can be seen. I wonder what the relationship between those is, if any. I would assume that there is one, but I don't probably. Yeah. I don't yeah. know enough to know what it might be. So they also say if you take an adult germ-free mouse and you infect it with norovirus, you give the virus orally, this will also restore the small intestinal parameters that we've talked about. So they don't have to be born and raised with virus present. You could just give them a dose and it fixes everything, which is really remarkable. Right? Yeah. Now they say, they made a statement in the paper that I, I thought was interesting. They say germ-free mice produce less virus than wild-type mice. And this, of course, makes perfect sense in light of Stephanie's, Stephanie Karst's paper, which we did last week, and saying that, you know, norovirus requires uh, bacteria for optimal infectivity. Right. So I, I wrote her an email because, you know, I, in her paper, at least for human norovirus strains, without bacteria, there was really no infectivity. If you treat the mice with antibiotics, barely any virus could be recovered. So I asked her why they can... Um, find some virus in these animals. So here is her, um, here's her response. My interpretation is that noroviruses have multiple mechanisms to breach the epithelium, one that is bacteria dependent and one that is bacteria independent, which is why you get a partial reduction in both antibiotic treated and germ-free mice. One other factor to consider is that in germ-free mice, the barriers to infection are lessened. It's well known that the mucus layer is thinner in germ-free mice, so a virus may have an easier time accessing the epithelium and being transcytosed across, and their immune systems are immature. One final piece of data that may be related to the idea of multiple entry pathways is Christian Wobis's data, where they deplete mice of M cells and saw so reduced but not ablated murine norovirus infection. I wonder if human noroviruses are more dependent on commensal bacteria since they need bacterial carbohydrates to infect cells in culture, whereas marine noroviruses don't. If only we could test germ-free people. Um, yeah, so that this is a problem we're going to get back to. Uh, can't do anything. You can't do these experiments in people. And, uh, and uh, Stephanie actually reminds me of something that we did not discuss last time, which is that the Mice don't, the mice, the one place where the mouse model doesn't reflect the human model for uh, noroviruses is the mice don't have this dependent on histo blood group antigens. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's they are right. different in that regard. So, by the way, in, uh, in Stephanie's email to me, which I just got yesterday, she writes, P.S. Has Rich ever told you what a great singer he is? Here he is in the local news last week, and she sends a, <laughs> oh, no. a picture of you which is in the public domain, Dr. Condit, so we can... That's correct. Uh, ...of you and a bunch of guys with uh, red vests and white shirts uh, singing like crazy. Wow. Yeah, that was one of the uh, social events that uh, flanks this, uh, that my visit to uh, Texas. I had to delay my visit to Texas to Monday because we had uh, the barber shop chorus that I belong to has their annual holiday concert uh, uh, in collaboration with the female equivalent. We had 40 people on stage singing. Nice. And it was great. Wow. We had a good time. It was Wait. good. So Stephanie yeah. brought her family. In this picture, you're front and center, Dr. Condit. Yeah, well, there's a there's a good pic. There's a couple of pictures there, one with uh, my quartet, the Flemtones, singing Duke of Earl, where we're doing a little uh, choreography, right? The Flemtones. The Flemtones. The Flemtones. The, actually, it's the fabulous Flemtones. With a PH for fabulous. Nice. I can but you see. guys have been doing it for a while, so you're not really green. Ah! Ah! Uh, ah! <laughs> He's not green flat. Right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Back to the paper. Uh, so all the work done so far is with this strain of norovirus that causes persistent infection. So they use the other one, uh, the, the norovirus strain, murine norovirus, again, that causes an acute infection. All right, it's more virulent, it's cleared, so they wild-type mice clear this virus in five to seven days as opposed to being persistently infected. Um, so they infect germ-free mice. They can find a little bit of virus in the stool at 10 days after infection, and just like 
with the other strain, the virus fixes the intestinal defect. So you don't have to have this persistent strain. You can have the acute strain as well. They both uh, restore the intestinal uh, morphology. Another th cool experiment they did, they went into their mouse colony and they recovered a norovirus. Of course, this is where noroviruses came in the from in the first place. They were recovered from Skip Virgin's mouse colony at Wash U. That's where they were discovered. And I think Stephanie and Christian both took place in that, right? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. Uh, they were uh, equally contributing authors to a science paper that describes that discovery. Yeah. So they, they got. They were postdocs together. They went into their own colony at NYU. They got a norovirus. It's a brand new strain. Uh, it can also reverse GI abnormalities in germ-free mice. So this is not something specific to a laboratory strains. So basically, they say, they say that there are quantitative differences in the ability of these three strains to recover the GI functions, but qualitatively, basically, they all make the, the, the germ-free mice uh, intestines look better than um, without virus. Um, now, one thing I would like to have seen with these last couple of experiments, this one in particular, I would like to see virus titers. Um, they don't always show virus titers in every experiment. So in particular, when they infect mice, uh, not make them persistent, but they when, when they infect mice at a certain age, I would like to see the virus there because just because it reverses the phenotype doesn't mean that it necessarily is replicating. You know, right. I mean, there's a lot of data in this paper to begin with, but personally, I like to see virus replication. And so uh, I would have liked to have seen that. You want to see plaque assays? I do. I want to see lots and lots of uh, plaque assays. OK, another interesting series of experiments. They look at um, a, a, a collection of cells in the intestine called innate lymphoid cells. So these are, ce these are immune cells that are not antigen specific, like B cells or T cells, because they don't have antigen receptors. But there are cells like, like helper cells or NK, natural killer cells, that have important immune functions, but they're not antigen specific. And they've been divided into three groups, groups one, two, and three, uh, based on the cytokines that they produce and the transcription proteins that are made and so forth. What they find is that germ-free mice have increased levels of the type 2 innate lymphoid cells in their intestine compared to conventional mice. All right. Where are you looking now, Vincent? Is this in the extended data? I think these data are in the extended data, yes. It's so complicated because there's four figures yeah. and nine extended data figures. Yeah. I know it's very difficult. And the figures are multi-panel also, right? Yeah. yeah. So lots of histology, flow cytometry. Basically, I'm just summarizing quite a bit of extended Fine. data. The, these, IL, these innate lymphoid type 2 cells are increased by the absence of germ-free mice. You infect them with murine norovirus, they go back to normal. Okay, so it's another parameter that they're looking at, which is reversed by um, uh, the infection with norovirus. So one virus can reverse many of the abnormalities caused by not having a bacteria in the gut. It's really remarkable. Now, as you might expect, they do the antibiotic treatment. They treat adult mice with antibiotics, much as Stephanie Karsten, her group did, uh, as we talked about last week. If you treat mice with antibiotics, they have similar abnormalities in intestinal morphology and T cell number. Okay, so the villus, the panis cells, the T cells, interferon gamma, all of this um, is screwed up. And if you infect with norovirus, it reverses them again. Here again, I would like to see virus titers. They don't show any. They also inoculate these antibiotic-treated mice with a couple of specific bacteria, in particular Bacteroides species and Lactobacillus species. Um, and they, sh they show that these have overlapping but not identical effects on host morphology. So if you treat mice with antibiotics, their intestine gets messed up. And if you feed them these bacteria, they restore certain aspects of the function you know, whether it be the villus or the T cells and so forth. So the bacteria, each bacterial species in our gut probably has slightly different uh, functions in maintaining gut morphology. It's really cool. 
They also looked at the genes that are turned on in the mouse intestine um, from these various mice to see if they can get some clues as to what's going on. So they take intestinal tissues from untreated germ-free mice or germ-free mice reconstituted with gut flora from, wild, from conventional mice or germ-free mice given norovirus. So they take RNA from this intestinal tissue, they sequence it, and they say what genes are turned on. So if you give these mice, these germ-free mice bacteria, not virus, but bacteria, this induces transcripts involved in metabolism, immunity, and blood vessel morphogenesis. If you give these mice norovirus, you get a limited selection of transcripts involved in lymphoid development, immune responses, and especially in type 1 interferon responses. So basically, both sets overlap in the, in the sense that you have genes needed for the development and function of lymphocytes. So that's what the virus is doing. That's what the bacteria are doing. They're allowing the lymphocyte development to proceed properly. And they have a nice little Venn diagram in uh, figure mm -hmm. 3A that, that, that points to the different genes turned on and shows the overlap. And, and uh, um, so, yeah, norovirus is not an exact replacement for the bacteria, but there's definitely enough overlap that you're clearly getting a lot of the same genes activated. Now, they wanted to know how important the interferon response was for this restoration of function. All right. So norovirus can restore um, the function in the gut of germ-free mice. So to answer this, they take mice lacking the receptor for type 1, type 1 interferon. These are called IFNAR null mice. You take those mice, you treat them with antibiotics, they have similar intestinal defects as conventional mice treated with antibiotics. But you can't reverse it with norovirus infection. So they show here that the virus is actually replicating, but in the absence of a type 1 interferon response, you don't get restoration of gut function. So this is very cool. So this, this implicates the interferon system in detecting the presence of virus and somehow feeding into uh, restoration of the intestinal function. Now, you can partially uh, restore this defect in the IFNAR mice by injecting them with poly-IC. So poly-IC is a, is a double-stranded synthetic RNA which can stimulate the interferon system. Um, uh, so wait a minute, this, <clears throat> isn't this um, not, uh, is this restoring the effect in the IFNAR knockouts or is this seeing if you can um, mimic the effect of uh, the murine norovirus in a, a germ-free mouse with uh, poly-IC. Right, so I may have this, this is uh, IFNAR mice treated with antibiotics, right? We know that if you infect them with norovirus, you can't restore um, the, the intestinal function. But if you give them poly-IC, you can, you can fix a few of the problems, like the villus with, but there's no, there's no restoration of T-cell function. So, in other words, uh, the amount of cytokine produced after you give them poly-IC can help uh, restore some of the function. So, IFNAR1 is not the whole story. There are other right. components of the interferon system that are participating in this as well. Uh, I think uh, a couple more experiments that are pretty cool. Um, if you treat mice with antibiotics, again, to deplete their intestinal bacteria, they're very susceptible to being killed by chemicals like dextran sodium sulfate, which is a consequence of increased intestinal permeability. So that basically, if you treat them with antibiotics, give them this chemical, most of the mice will die. If you feed them norovirus, it improves their survival. And you also need the interferon type 1 system for this. So the effects the lack of bacteria are having on the protective aspects of the gut can also be restored by norovirus infection. Another cool experiment, and this is the last one we'll do, if you give antibiotic-treated mice Citrobacter, which is a gut, gut of a bacterium that can cause diarrhea, weight loss, and, and various pathologies in the gut, you give norovirus at the same time as the Citrobacter, 
it protects them from the pathogenic effects of the bacterium. So they speculate that this may be because the giving them mice antibiotics takes away the robust immune response in the gut, so they're very susceptible to Citrobacter. You give them norovirus at the same time as the Citrobacter, you restore the immune function, and it can protect the mice uh, against these bacteria. So it's really a cool example of how viruses in the gut are probably helping us to a certain extent. They maintain, some of them, at least. Yeah. Some of them, yeah. They maintain a good immune response, and that keeps us protected against other pathogens as well. So the authors say symbiotic viruses must exist in the tract. So, of course, this is a, a norovirus, which is given exogenously to these animals. But they say some of these viruses that are in there must be protective. Uh, which, again, I think is something we've been thinking about for a long time. I'm really happy to see these data. It's the first that have come along to say, yeah, there are other examples of how viruses can protect you. Um, now it's a matter of figuring it out. And I'll throw out this question, which I think is really a tough one. How do we show in people that our gut virome is beneficial? Because we can do this in animals you know, forever and ever. We can figure out the mechanisms. But how do we do it in people? I think you're going to have to start with correlative evidence um, where you get a bunch of people in different degrees of intestinal health or antibiotic treatment um, and survey their viromes, which I don't think has really been done a whole lot. People, everybody's obsessed with the, the bacterial microbiome, um, but start doing surveys of viromes and seeing if you can find correlations after people are treated with antibiotics, do some viruses um, become more prevalent? Uh, if so, is that helping those people? I mean, what, what is their symptomology? Um, you know, are they less affected because there's more of, of some virus in there? Um, so I think, I think it's going to have to be done in that kind of a population level because, as you point out, we don't, you, you can't make germ-free humans. Uh, there are uh, clinical situations, we've covered some of these, uh, where people have undergone uh, fairly heavy-duty antibiotic treatment. And uh, some of these people have difficulty recolonizing and wind up uh, colonizing with Clostridium difficile. Right. Uh, that's that we, we covered this when uh, there was a pick of the week that was a fecal transplant that has become a uh, a fairly routine uh, procedure now, I think. And so some of these uh, clinical situations, I think, are situations where people might look at it with a different eye now. Now, yeah. uh, I think that's mostly thought of in terms of uh, gut bacteria. Um, you're going to have to look at viruses as well, I suppose. I think you have to do both, right? Because yeah. you have to look at people, as, as Alan said, people with certain disease conditions, you're going to have to look at the gut virome and the microbiome. So far, people have just looked at the bacteria, and I think they're missing a lot by not including whatever viruses are there. But so if, we should find some people who have C. diff and give them norovirus, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be real happy about that. Yeah. Well, you know, noro is one of those viruses you can give to people, right? So you could design some kind of an experiment with that particular virus. But as you said, Alan, yeah, the initial studies are all going to be associations. And that's what we have for the microbiome as well, associations with disease states. It's very hard to prove uh, anything. And eventually, if you have enough numbers, you may get some compelling data. But uh, Now, the down, of course, the downside of that as well is as soon as you start having correlations, people go running around saying, oh, A causes B. Um, and we already see this going on with the yeah. bacterial microbiome yeah. where people yeah. say, oh, wait, well, people are obese because they have an unhealthy microbiome. No, no, that's, I'm sure that's not the whole story. Um, and I'm sure this is going to happen with the virome as well, that we're going to get all sorts of misperceptions of, of what is actually causative here. But you, you have to do those experiments. You have to find the correlations because in humans we can't do these sorts of, of neat manipulations. So I, I asked my virology class last year, I said, how could you ever get some data on uh, the, the association of the virome with a beneficial effect? And, you know, we had a similar discussion. And one person had a really neat answer. And she said, well, someday we're probably going to have broad spectrum antivirals. And when they start giving those to people, I bet we see some effects. Just like you give people antibiotics, we know the gut gets messed up, right? 
and you're going to see you give people broad spectrum antivirals that could give us some clues about what's going on here. So I thought that was a good answer. That's a cool thought, yeah. The other thing I'd like to know is whether there are other viruses that will have this same effect in the mice. Okay. Sure. I just looked up and I just looked up and there is a disease called epizootic diarrhea of infant mice. There's a mouse rotavirus. So there's another uh, model gut virus that you could use in the same system and ask whether you get the same effects. It might even be interesting to look and see if there are viruses that aren't even gut viruses that will do some of this. So my guess is not. I just I just don't know. There's lots to do. No, I, I bet it's not restricted to the gut, just like the beneficial microbiome is not restricted to the gut as well. They're probably everywhere. Skin, you know, eyes, lungs, liver, what, whichever organ. We're not sterile, guys. No. Nope. Okay. That's it for that. Let's move on to some uh, email. And um, for the first time in a long time, we have a lot of non-Ebola virus email. It's really yes. Remarkable. By the way, Vincent, uh, is this 18 pages, all of it, or do you have another 100 pages <laughs> somewhere else? Yeah, we have more. This is just a small part of it. Yeah. And we're going to have to do an all-email show someday. We should, we should do that, yes. Someday, yeah. Maybe in 2015. <laughs> yeah, right. that's right around the corner. First one is from Randy, who writes, Hello, Twiv hosts. The current conditions in Phoenix, miserably hot. 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 8% humidity, 4 mile per hour winds. Next week's highs of 108. Yeah, but look at that humidity. It's 8%. It's a dry heat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a dry heat. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 100 degrees is 100 degrees. Uh, this was from a while ago, I assume. Uh, I don't think it's 100 now in Phoenix, no. No. In TWIV 280, you read my email regarding canine distemper virus. In episode 289, you read an email from Alice, who had been through a similar ordeal. She asked if the distemper vaccine might have made her dog's illness worse. There is a case where it's thought it could do so. Consider so, uh, could, could you, um, I had trouble with this because I was having trouble remembering that TWIV 280 thing and what the issue here is, really. Could you remind me of that? So she had, Alice had an experience where she had adopted a dog. It, it appeared to be healthy, and then it appeared to develop an illness. Uh, she brought it to the vet. The vet had given her, a, the dog, a canine distemper vaccine as part of the, you know, wellness treatment after Alice adopted this dog. And she was just wondering if the vaccine might have contributed to the dog's illness. I don't remember the specific conditions, but I think they'll they'll come up in this email here. And the, and the question arises whether the vaccine, the question, one of the questions that comes up is whether the vaccine can exacerbate right. uh, uh, disease or whether the vaccine itself can sometimes cause problems in the absence of wild type disease, right? That's right. That's right. Right. Okay. So, um, Randy writes, consider the following, and he's quoting, concomitant with immunologic recovery during the further course of the disease, inflammation occurs in the demyelinating lesions with progression of the lesions in some animals. A series of experiments in vitro suggested that chronic demyelination is due to a bystander mechanism associated with the virus-induced immune response in which antibody cell dependent cell mediated reactions play an important role. The mechanism of inflammatory demyelination in canine distemper encephalitis, which is the disease that Alice's dog had, is uncertain, but macrophages are thought to play an important effector role in the lesion. Serum and cerebrospinal fluid containing anti canine distemper virus and anti myelin antibodies from dogs with CDE were tested for their ability to generate reactive oxygen species in macrophages in primary dog brain cell cultures. The majority of serum samples and several cerebrospinal fluid samples from animals with inflammatory demyelination elicited a signal in infected dog brain cell cultures. In contrast, none of these samples induced a positive response in uninfected cultures, which contained large numbers of myelin antigen presenting cells. It was concluded that antiviral antibody-induced secretion of reactive oxygen species known to be highly toxic for brain tissue may play an important role 
in white matter damage in inflammatory lesions, supporting a previous hypothesis of bystander demyelination in canine distemper encephalitis. So the, the idea here is that if you have an antibody or an immune response against the virus, this can exacerbate the, the encephalitis that, that's being caused. And this, this kind of mechanism is also suspected in, in human demyel demyelating diseases of some types too. Correct. So back to Randy. This isn't well understood, but it's conceivable to me and a few virologists I've spoken with in the past that the increase in antiviral antibodies produced in response to the vaccine adds fuel, if you will, to this bystander demyelination and could lead to worsening neurologic symptoms similar to what Alice described. Additionally, anecdotal as it may be, there appears to be a belief in a surprising number of veterinarians that giving a canine distemper virus vaccine to an animal that has been naturally infected can cause complications. There was little or no elaboration on complications. All that said, my non-virologist brain tends to think this does not apply to Alice's dog since based on her description, he was probably acutely infected. This is a biphasic demyelinating disease. I suspect his worsening condition was the result of primary demyelination and inflammation caused by viral replication in the CNS rather than the second aforementioned cause. Thoughts? Do I get an amateur virologist merit badge? Thanks Definitely. Again. Yes. Thanks again for the great show. I anxiously await every new episode and have even begun listening from episode one. Okay, so it sounds pretty good to me, Randy, but uh, we have a friend of the show, Patty Pesavento, who we talked about her work on TWIV 214. Uh, she is an author on an article about canine distemper, encephalitis, and colleagues. So I asked her for her thoughts on this. And uh, would you mind, uh, Alan, to read Pat sure. Patty's response? Um, so Patty says, the short answer is that with regard to both old dog encephalitis and post-vaccine distemper, only individual animals have been examined and no one knows what's going on or has gone on with the actual viruses themselves in these cases. There's an unpredictable and sometimes prolonged period of persistence that can precede a systemic infection, and this understandably creates healthy skepticism about whether or not post-vaccine distemper uh, or old dog encephalitis is actually a slow response or a recent exposure. We are blissfully unencumbered by any solid data, so the conversation is potentially endless. Um, and then a quick paper summary. Fairley's paper from New Zealand describes two cases, vaccinated litter mates that were persuasively post-vaccination cases, uh, because first of all, while New Zealand still has a canine, di canine distemper vaccination program, the virus is not seen by New Zealand veterinarians. And second, uh, tissue distribution, because in both dogs, non-nervous tissues were spared, which is atypical for the natural course of acute infection. And third, while these dogs were litter mates, they were adults when they developed encephalitis, grew up geographically isolated, so this is the twin separated at birth uh, scenario, um, developed disease in single dog households. The presumption in these cases and for other old dog encephalitis and post-vaccine canine distemper is that there's an alteration or deficiency in host response immune suppression, aging, or a second pathogen that permits viral attack uh, by a pre-existing virus in the on the nervous system. What we've missed in the paper was sequencing data proving that the virus was a vaccination strain. Also, there's no way um, after the fact to analyze any deficiency if one existed in the immune response. I've heard many state I've heard many say that this is an autoimmune response, but I can't buy that. First of all, because it's a it is a back in theory. And secondly, because there's plenty of virus in the lesion, glia primarily. So the exciting question really is, where is the RNA virus, vaccine strain or not, um, uh, where, where the RNA virus, vaccine strain or not, can persist, and what triggers the cyto uh, cytolytic infection in these cases? There are some similarities between canine distemper, uh, CNS localized disease in dogs, and measles with subacute sclerosing parencephalitis in humans. Um, other thoughts, there have been primate outbreaks of canine distemper, and so an important question that comes right to the fore is what you touched on in TWIV 286, would having a large group of non-vaccinated people provide a niche for canine distemper? I don't think I got my distemper shot. Um, <laughs> if so, it's been I'm, recommended. 
good for me. <laughs> if so, I'm moving to New Zealand. My laboratory has explored the issue of cross-species transmission by analyzing full-length sequences of uh, canine distemper isolates obtained from a cohort of susceptible predators, dog, gray fox, striped skunk, and raccoon, from Northern California in one season, that's a temporal snapshot, and from a single county geographic snapshot. For raccoons, um, we also sequenced isolates at the same time period, but from multiple locations. We're still considering what we've found, probably need Dupre's help, uh, but there's clear species rather than geographic grouping of viruses. I consider the raccoon a virus star here, whether um, a raccoon polyomavirus or canine distemper, a star. And since Europe is now declaring war on raccoons, and sends, sends a, uh, a link to an article in The Guardian, uh, we can no longer say it is the quintessentially North, North American mammal, but they are everywhere they are found at the absolute closest interface between wild animals and humans. Uh, it would help me tremendously with research funding if raccoons were included in the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure that would go over very well with the current Congress. As an aside, and as one of the few veterinarian pathologists, pseudovirologists pseudo in your herd of listeners, I would add that the study of the natural history of viral infections, including the study of viral pathogens, uh, pathogenesis in true cellular and animal targets of disease, is interesting and perhaps undervalued. I'm Italian, and for your information, my hands are flying around in print here. <laughs> As Dupre stated, we cannot make decisions about how to protect the population uh, without reading its true tissue travel diary. Uh, take care, your energy is remarkable. It's rainy and cold in Ames, Iowa. Back to sunny, albeit dry, California tomorrow. So basically, uh, Alice had originally written to ask whether um, the disease in her dog was vaccine-related canine distemper. Right. And, and Randy's idea is correct. It probably isn't. But as, as Patty says, I love this sentence. We are blissfully unencumbered by yes. any solid data, so the conversation yeah. is endless. So we don't really know. I think we have to have Patty on sometime to talk about this. Yeah, yeah that'd she, be fun. She sounds like fun. Uh, in one of these papers, I think one of the papers that she quoted here about, oh, well, the paper about the collies. Mm -hmm. um, there's in the discussion to that paper. There's a discussion of uh, vaccine-associated uh, canine distemper and whether some of it has to do with interaction with wild-type virus or not. And uh, it seems like the evidence for that is pretty slim, and the thinking is more that it has to do with uh, uh, probably immune problems in the dogs. Uh, so you get occasional dogs that. Uh, don't handle the attenuated virus. Well, it is an attenuated uh, virus, the vaccine strain. So. Mm. All right. Uh, next one's from Robin, who sends us a little um, spreadsheet for doing centigrade and Celsius and Fahrenheit conversion, which we'll share with everyone because I guess we need this. Uh, and then the next one is for you, Rich. Protesh writes, Hello, Dr. Racaniello. Here is some viral news from the University of Florida I would like to share. I am sure Dr. Condit will like this since it's about a pox virus. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, Pratesh, I like it for uh, more than just that it's a pox virus. I've got a rap about this. Uh, Pratesh, by the way, is a graduate student in our um, PhD program, and uh, the he links to a press release about the discovery, a press release, I guess, from the University of Florida about the discovery of this uh, pox virus in sea otters, and I found the original uh, article here, which we could stick in the show notes if you want. Uh, it's by um, a bunch of people. The notable uh, authors are, uh, well, Tuomi Murray, Garner Gertz, Nordhausen, Burke Huntington, Getsy, Nielsen, Archer, Manis, uh, Welling, uh, Wellahan, and Waltzik. And uh, Jim Wellahan, actually, he's a Wellahan and Waltzik are uh, investigators in the uh, uh, College of uh, Vet, in the Vet School, 
uh, at uh, UF. I was actually on Wellahan's PhD committee as well. And these guys are kind of virus, uh, animal virus discovery guys, veterinary virus discovery guys, and they come up with all kinds of stuff. And one they came up with was a pox virus at sea otters. Where this comes around full is I studied sea otters when I was in college. That oh. was, I was even considering uh, animal behavior and of uh, sea otters or wildlife biology as an alternate career. They're really I cute. Used to go down to, oh yeah, I used to go down to Hopkins Marine Station uh, on a regular basis and sit there all day and watch the sea otters. So these animals uh, used to populate the entire uh, Pacific coast and they were hunted uh, almost to extinction. They thought they were actually extinct. Uh, until the hunting was outlawed in like 1911 or something. And they disappeared entirely until about 1950 when a few showed up uh, on the California coast. Uh, and they they made a comeback in both California and Alaska, though recently there's been uh, more trouble there. Are, I don't know what the population is now, but it's not many thousands. It may only be several hundreds. Uh, in California and Alaska, and these are two different subspecies of a uh, sea lion or uh, uh, sea otter. And interestingly, this virus that uh, these investigators, so these were a couple of clinical cases where there were stranded uh, sea otters, one Alaskan sea otter uh, and one California sea otter. So there's northern and southern sea otters, and there's, as I said, different uh, subs subspecies. And uh, so some people taking care of these stranded animals noticed these lesions and uh, called in the University of Florida guys to uh, investigate and they found uh, by both electron microscopy and uh, by sequence analysis uh, pox viruses in these things and interestingly although they only have limited sequence analysis they appear to be identical even though they're in uh, different species um, and when you do the phylogenetics it looks like it uh, completely novel pox virus, a different genus that's sort of in between uh, the vertebrate or the orthopox viruses and um, the parapox viruses. I find the EM images interesting because they look more like parapox viruses and orthopox viruses, though they have some knobby things on the outside that I have seen anywhere else except in uh, one of Waltzek's uh, fish pox viruses that he showed me recently. So, sorry, I got a little turned on by that. No, that's cool. Pox viruses and sea otters, what are you going to do? <laughs> I, I, think, I think that's why Pratesh sent it in. He figured he'd... Yeah, he, he figured he'd uh, turn me on with that. It's Actually, cool. I have other involvement with these uh, guys as well because uh, I co-mentored a student who um, investigated a sea lion pox virus that showed up in California and actually all over the place uh, as well. Interestingly, in that case, it, the the um, fear of the veterinarians, this, this pox virus would show up when these uh, animals were being rehabilitated in uh, rescue facilities, and they were concerned that they were giving it to them there. Uh, and so the work that this guy Hendrik Nollens uh, did during his uh, PhD, he, iso he isolated this virus, grew it up, and uh, actually uh, created an ELISA where he could detect it. It turns out that uh, over 90% of the seals in the wild probably uh, have this thing or have been exposed to it. And so it's just showing up under captivity when they're uh, sort of reoccurring under conditions of immunological stress. And the vets weren't introducing it or causing any kind of problem. It's just out there. It would be interesting to see the same thing with the sea otters whether this is a pox virus that's actually uh, quite common in these animals or if these are just a couple isolated cases. I'll bet you it's all over the place. Cool. All right. If it is, then we ought to stop worrying about it. <laughs> Ooh, Rich, Rich froze up there, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, Rich froze up on that one. I hope I didn't break him. It broke him. Uh-oh. Oh, my Rich, God. are you still with us? Hook. Uh oh, he's gone. Oh, yeah, wow. we've got him seized on the screen there. Crap. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, let's see. He's on the show notes, so let's send yeah. him a uh, a rich, rich. <laughs> you are frozen. <laughs> In the meantime, <laughs> let him figure out how to get back. Maybe <laughs> I get unfrozen. Let me send him a link to the uh, hangout. Oh yeah. 
and hopefully he will... I have to log into my Gmail to get the link. Here. Come back and join us. In the meantime, I'll read the next one from Philip, who writes, Kathy et al. in this week's broadcast, the group talked about the number of PhDs in biomedical research programs and the possibility of encouraging them to teach high school students. The debate seems to be whether PhDs from an exclusively biomedical field would improve science education in high school. My wife, who you sing with, and he's talking to Kathy here, is a grade school music teacher, so I have additional knowledge about her from her about being a teacher in Michigan. Here are my two thoughts. There are multiple programs uh, in Michigan that offer a PhD in science education. These programs combine research with advanced training on teaching science and students in such a program generally already have teaching experience. While the typical individual with a research intensive PhD may have excellent research and critical thinking skills, he or she isn't, however, likely to have experience teaching adolescents and dealing with all of the non-science aspects of K-12 education. And he gives a couple of links to the Michigan programs and gives an overview of uh, the mission of science education, which is to blend science theory, research, and practical application to explore current issues in science teaching and learning. And he goes on, I've come across several grad students and postdocs that think they can just go get a job as a high school teacher if all else fails. Fact is, you can't just walk in there and teach. You have to become certified, which in Michigan means meeting a variety of coursework requirements and internship experience and passing particular tests. At the University of Michigan, the College of Education website appears to offer options that can be completed within a year if separate from another degree. This certificate, once earned, must be periodically renewed pending further professional development. Michigan does offer an alternate route program for individuals who qualify to complete certification coursework while holding a teaching position. In either case, it has been my observation that various school administrators seem to have different priorities in hiring. Some prefer to hire a candidate with the most relevant classroom experience with or without a graduate degree. In other districts, the cheapest qualified candidate is selected due to budgetary constraints. In either situation, a person with research intensive PhD without prior K-12 teaching experience may be viewed as a less than ideal candidate for that district. If the quality of high school science teachers is in question, another way to address it might be offering current educators different professional development opportunities that address some of the issues discussed by the group. Most science education professional development focuses on improving effective education techniques. Perhaps a university might offer a non-degree professional development program for science teachers to participate in a research lab during the summer in some form. Uh, regards Phil, who was a research fellow at the uh, University of Michigan. So I, I do think it's really um, not correct to assume that if science doesn't work for you, you, you can just go teach high school. Or any other profession for that matter. Like I, like science writing, right? I get, I get that a lot. Well, if science doesn't work out, I'll just be, be a science journalist. Yeah, right. Um, but, but yeah, this in the case of teaching, this is a highly regulated business and um, and with good reason. And you need to get the proper certifications and there's a whole procedure to do that. And there are full-time professionals who have gone this route and so you can't just walk in and say, hey, I've got a PhD, hire me. Um, yeah. Hey, welcome back, Rich. Thanks. Another, another interesting point here is that um, a lot of people who do PhDs probably would like to teach from the start. I think it's a great idea to get a research training so that you know what science is about. But clearly, yes. you have to have a teaching training too. So it would be great if we had programs built that could do both things. And, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not so hard to do. You, you bring someone through a research track, but offering coursework or interactivity or teaching experience that would make them ready to be a teacher when they're done. And actually, if you know that's the direction you want to go in, it would make sense to complete some of the required coursework as an undergraduate. Exactly. Because that's when that's when it would be straightforward to do it. You're already in school. Add those courses, um, not to insult education departments, but they're they're not 
terribly taxing in most cases. <laughs> these these are not courses that are going to be like your organic chemistry requirement. These are courses where you're going to you're going to learn important information, but it's not going to you know tank your GPA probably. Um, so you could add those on as an undergraduate. You come out, you go to graduate school, and and then at least you will fill those requirements, and then you can get licensed wherever you, wherever it is you want to uh, teach. This is a situation where, uh, in my experience at least, there's a distinct difference between doing a PhD in a medical school and doing a PhD at a, uh, in a liberal arts uh, environment. Because typically in a medical school, at least in my experience, the uh, stipends for a PhD are supported as research assistants. Yes. Uh, rather than graduate assistants or TAs, whether, whereas in an undergraduate setting, you're a TA. And as a TA, you will have teaching responsibilities and you, ac you accumulate some uh, teaching cred. And we have students who uh, partway through their experience uh, in graduate training in the medical school decide that they want to uh, become teachers and it's very difficult for them to get the appropriate uh, teaching experience to fill out their CV. It's got to be a real deliberate effort. All right, Alan, could you take the next one? Okay, uh, David writes, Dear Vincent and friends, your session with Janet Butel and Rick Lloyd was fascinating, especially enlightening were Janet's thoughtful comments about the proposed association of SV40 and human cancers. I have a connection to Janet as Fred Rapp, her thesis advisor, was the founding chair of our department at Penn State's College of Medicine, and he was here for my first decade or so as a member. Fred built a unit currently called the Department of Microbiology and Immunology that still consists primarily of virologists. Among the current faculty are 10 virologists and two others who do viral pathogenesis. Fred helped establish an, out, an outstanding training program here, and our trainees have gone on to successful careers in academia and elsewhere. Although we no longer have a separate departmental graduate program, training in virology is still provided through an option in our umbrella biomedical sciences graduate program. Janet is rightly proud of the virology program at Baylor, which incidentally not only gave us Fred Rapp, but also Dick Courtney, who chaired our department from 1990 to 2012. That being said about Baylor Virology, we think we measure up pretty well here at Penn State Hershey. We encourage your listeners who are interested in postgraduate or postdoctoral training in almost any aspect of virology to consider us. We eagerly anticipate the TWIV bump. Well, in that case, you probably ought to take out an ad. You know, we do those. Um, with respect to another virology program you discussed, Maurice Green founded the Institute for Virology at St. Louis University in 1964, and many fine virologists established their careers there. I had the opportunity to interact with Maurice, who was the postdoctoral mentor, mentor of um, Heschel Raskus, my postdoctoral mentor at Washington University in St. Louis. Among Maurice's contributions, and there were many, was an exhaustive analysis of tumors for adenovirus DNA following the discovery that adenoviruses produce tumors in rodents. The upshot was that there was no evidence linking adenoviruses to cancer in humans. It's 27 degrees C and overcast in Hershey. This is from a while ago, I think. Uh, visibility is 10 miles and the ceiling is 33,500 feet. Thank you very much. Um, many thanks for TWIV, although you wouldn't think it was possible, it keeps getting better. And Dave, as he said, is in the Department of uh, Microbiology there in Hershey. Glad to hear it gets better. Yes. <laughs> you know, there are lots of strong virology departments uh, in the country and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Yes. Um, I will take the next one because this is a polio email. This is from Jing who writes, recently after bragging about studying polio replication for my PhD research, I was questioned by an anti-vaccine guy about how the polio vaccine keeps up with the high mutation rate of the viruses. I played cool and mumbled something about the vaccine recognizes the most conserved features, etc. However, immediately I started to wonder about the same thing in the back of my head. As an RNA virus, polio is known to have a high mutation rate near the edge of error catastrophe. Why then, so far, have we only identified three serotypes of polio, and all of which are targeted perfectly well by the vaccines unchanged since Salk developed them in the 50s? What a failure for poor polio if from all its potential adaptive quasi-species pool, not a single virus can bypass the vaccine-induced immune response. Is there genetic conflict ever been observed between the polio capsid and the receptor? Love your podcast. Keep up the great work. It's interesting that you should bring this up because recently there was an example of polio virus escaping 
antibodies. And this was a recent outbreak um, in the Republic of Congo in 2010, where essentially the outbreak, which involved 445 paralytic cases, the case fatality rate was 47%, which is higher than normal. And the reason way higher than normal. Yeah. Reason is that the strain had escaped antibodies, and uh, they they isolated this virus from a number of the individuals, and they sequenced it, and it has changes in the antigenic sites, which makes it highly resistant to antibodies uh, in the population. And this has only happened, as far as we know, one other time in history, and that was in Finland in the 1980s. And in both cases, low vaccination coverage accompanied by circulation of virus led to the selection of antibody escape viruses. Now, th these viruses have fitness costs associated with these changes, so they're not likely to spread uh, globally, especially in the face of a good uh, vaccination program. So it can happen. In the laboratory, you can readily uh, isolate vaccine escape viruses. I think we just don't see them uh, in the wild because they're not as fit as other viruses. And I think your original idea uh, that these changes somehow alter the function of the capsid is probably correct. It's certainly much less antigenically variable than influenza virus, right? So uh, part of the reason is likely to do with the capsid. All right, Rich Condit, can you take Shane's? Is he, um, is he gone? Yeah, he says you guys are frozen. Is it me? Well, you're not frozen to me, and I think I, I think you can hear me. So I think we're okay. Oh dear. But previously, he crashed with his brand new PC. <laughs> it just goes to show, Alan. People they buy these Windows machines and That's they crash it. during Hangouts, right? That must be it, or it could be his internet connection. I'm not sure. I had a problem for a while where mine would periodically drop out, if you recall. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take the next one, Alan. Okay. Uh, so we're up to Shane, right? Oh, is, it, is Rich back? Wait a minute. Ooh, I see him. He's. I've got two of him showing up in the bar there. Oh, we don't want two Riches, do we? Oh, no. They're, now he's down to one. Hey, are you back? Uh, go ahead, Alan, read that letter. Okay, Shane uh, writes, Hi, Twiff gang. I've written a few times to your show as a layperson with an interest in science. Well, now, after some encouragement from a scientist friend and my enjoyment for science kindled by Twiv, I'm finally making a start on a science degree at University of Queensland. I start my first class in less than a month, entitled Genes, Cells, and Evolution, and am planning on majoring in biomedical science and microbiology. I'm especially looking forward to virology, parasitology, and immunology. Without the constant companionship and mentorship of the TWIV, TWIM, and TWIP crew, I would have never thought of venturing outside my current field of experience. I would also especially like to thank Vincent for his virology courses on Coursera that I've been a rabid consumer of. Keep up the great work, hoping the Twix media empire will continue to be a big part of my science education. And uh, Shane says that it's a clear day, 19 degrees Celsius, clear skies with uh, winds, west-northwest winds of 13 kilometers per hour. Dew point is minus 2, pressure is 1,011 millibars. So thank you, Shane. In Australia. Yeah, and, and good job. Good, hey, that's uh, great. I think it's great that we inspired you, and uh, good yeah. luck. Good luck, and if you get any hard questions, you know, throw them our way. <laughs> hey, Rich Condit, are you here? Uh, I'm back again, yeah. Take the next one. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Take the next one before Take, you go away. Before I crash again. Okay. Steve writes, uh, and he links to a blog. Uh, that is, I don't, uh, I don't even want to look at this blog because this is going to be a do not link Ill. thing, yeah. Right. Um, the it's the blog is Doctor Brownstein's Holistic Medicine. Uh, hi, Vincent. I know you and the team at TWIF hate all the hype from the anti-vaccination lobby as much as I do, but you may have noticed that recently they have been engaging in something of a feeding frenzy over an ex-CDC scientist who has supposedly admitted to altering data so as to hide an association between the vaccine and MMR. I have not been following this debate as I got tired of it years ago, but I expect that whatever these particular revelations are, they do not really 
really make any significant difference to the whole body of data. I would, however, be interested in your team's take on all of this, particularly as you are scientists who are more likely to be uh, heated than most. Apologies for bringing this up once again, but I do think it ne does need nipping in the bud. Many thanks, Steve. Steve is uh, writing us from uh, England. And uh, so this is a uh, story about uh, a guy at CDC who made some sort of public statement about how he regrets not speaking up about paper uh, being not included in a publication where the CDC was researching the potential link between uh, vaccines and autism and it uh, that his statement got blown up way out of proportion and is and conflated completely out of some, completely out of context yeah and it was conflate uh, conflated with uh, some other publication uh, by this guy Cooper and I'm uh, a little lame on that uh, connection. Uh, Alan, you found a couple of links on Yeah, this. so there's there's a good long post over at Science Based Medicine uh, blog that I think we've we've linked to before. Um, we've discussed this before. Yeah, and, the, and this there's this blog post um, goes through the the saga of this this ridiculous manufacturerversy. Um, and there's a shorter version of it on Snopes.com. The the standard internet debunking site. That's how big this thing has gotten. It's actually got its own Snopes page. Um, and so what happened was this this poor schmuck uh, made the mistake of talking to this Hooper character who's a, a huge anti-vax nut. Um, and uh, Hooper apparently without the researchers knowledge uh, recorded the conversation and then took some very tiny snippets of it out of context and put them together into a YouTube video that spins this huge conspiracy theory. And that has been the focus of this whole thing is uh, we found a whistleblower at the CDC and this is what he says and, and then they go off about this whole thing. Um, it's just a complete sham. Um, the, the whole thing is ridiculous. Uh, Hooper himself had some sort of publication. Is that right, or am I mixing that up with something else? Is he did. He yes. a bio uh, I think he has a background in in biomedical research. He's a biochemist. He's a biochemist. Yeah. yeah so he um, he did a a, a re he's done a bunch of reanalyses of data where he takes somebody that else's data, tortures the heck out of it, and tries to pull out what he wanted to believe, and and then publishes it in some fiftieth tier journal. Um, so that's his shtick, and he got a hold of this guy and has has now created this thing. And whatever publication is at the center of this that was uh, Hooper's has been uh, retracted by the journal, by the way. Uh, right. So there so. there are a couple. Of, yeah, there are a couple of publications involved here, and and it's just it's a big, huge abuse of statistics, and it's a mess. Okay. So those are really nice write-ups on it. If you want more information on it, uh, yes. all, uh, those are very well done, both the Snopes and the uh, Science-Based Medicine um, site. Yeah. All right. We have two more emails, um, and this and one of them is from Neil, who sends a link to a scientific paper scam that uh, the TWIV team has been made aware of. Um, yes. And so we will not read the headline, but you can no. read it <laughs> nor yourself. Will, nor will we quote from the paper. Which is one sentence repeated many times. Yes. It apparently got published. Yes. Another, another indictment of publishing, I guess. It, it was one of these um, one of these predatory journals, and somebody um, wanted to be taken off their mailing list, so they submitted a paper. And uh, it's, it's good. It got published. Yep. And the last one's from David, who writes, Dear esteemed scientists of TWIV, writing from Marina del Rey, California, 65F, not surprisingly, our range is 60 to 75 all year, humidity 55, winds west-northwest 1 miles per hour. More importantly, the surf forecast shows a mix of northwest swell and south-southwest swell. Surf is mainly in the 1 to 2 foot zone, and local standout surf spots are seeing waist-high sets with the right tide. Dude. Hey, we don't get that out here, I'll tell you. <laughs> you keep telling listeners that Ebola has a 21-day incubation period. Data from the current epidemic in West Africa is probably your source for this statement. For instance, many people cite 
the New England Journal publication, and he gives the link. But as stated in that article, approximately 95% of the patients had symptom onset within 21 days. Indeed, figure 3A in that article shows many cases, or rather 5% occurring outside the 21-day period. You see where I'm going with this? This is our public assurances that 21 days is the incubation period. Where are you at all? I say our assurances because I advise pu our public health department and I'm participating in our city's Ebola preparedness. When I was asked to join the Ebola team, the first thing I did was learn about Ebola and viruses from TWIV, a godsend. Please look at figure 3A in the article and tell me why you are never expressing your uncertainty about this 21-day policy. As you rightly point out, scientists are loath to express certainty in 5% of cases beyond the 21-day period is not a trivial amount of cases. Our public health department, like many in the U.S., is currently monitoring several people in home quarantine for Ebola virus disease. They will follow them for 21 days, just as recommended by the CDC. If a single one of those quarantined persons subsequently develops Ebola disease after quarantine is over, that is after 21 days since exposure, this whole 21-day thing will be blown apart. Our credibility, yours and mine, will, and ours will be damaged. If you were advising the mayor of Gotham, would you tell him 21 days or would you tell him longer and how much longer? Recognizing that in this case, trust in public health and its scientists may be as important as best use of resources and trump the extra week of lost freedom that quarantined individuals might face if the period were longer. Don't cop out and say that you are not advising, you are just virologists. I greatly enjoy your show. I was invited on a UCLA panel on Ebola and held for the community last week and I told the assembled audience to listen to TWIV if they wanted to learn about Ebola. If I were still a medical student, I would be completely drawn into virology and infectious diseases at Mount Sinai by your show. I trained at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in NYU. Great work. We're not advising. We're just virologists. <laughs> hey. All right, look. Um, I, I don't base... First of all, I don't, I don't think we need to quarantine people because... Having looked at all the previous outbreak data, nobody gets sick with Ebola unless they get it from someone who's already sick. So there's no asymptomatic transmission as far as we can tell. So I'm not big on the quarantine, whether it be of people coming back uh, from, from um, Western Africa or, or other potential exposures. The 21 days is based on those previous 23 or 24 outbreaks, not just on the current outbreak, which you cite in that article. And a, um, an epidemiologist some time ago uh, did another analysis of the data, and he concluded that 21 days is an appropriate time, and that maybe it would be two from, from 2 to 10% off with a 95% confidence interval. But he thought that the current outbreak was was in the same range as well. So I would say, yes, I would say 21 days is appropriate. We have no evidence that it's not. Uh, as I said, you're not infectious during this incubation period anyway. And until we have data uh, uh, otherwise, I think we're safe in saying this because I think to go longer just increases uh, the burden without any uh, demonstrated proof. I'm wondering what you guys think. Well, no matter what you do, you're not going to be risk-free. You're not going to you, you you can't get it a hundred percent right. It's all a matter of uh, uh, of probabilities. And I trust the guys who have uh, analyzed these data to say that uh, 21 days, all things considered, is uh, a reasonable uh, interval. Notice from the bell curve in that uh, paper that the vast majority of cases. Uh, show up with a much shorter incubation period. It's it's usually about a week or ten days, something like that. So okay. twenty one days is probably plenty sufficient. Yeah, and I'm, I, I haven't some. I haven't delved into this into the data in this figure, but I'm not entirely sure that it says what the letter writer thinks that it says. Um, so observed times between exposure and disease onset for all countries, including only cases with multiple exposure days. Mm. I'm not sure what mm. they mean by that and which day you start counting from. And then panel E is time between disease onset in an index case patient and disease onset in the person infected by the index case patient, which is a different question. Um, so what you're saying, Alan, is that some of these individuals could have been infected a second time within the bell curve, which would push their 
incubation period beyond the yeah I'm not sure I'm not sure if we have and from the current epidemic one of the big problems is we're we're having a hard time keeping track of when people were exposed and who was exposed so I'm I, as I say I haven't I haven't delved into exactly where these numbers in this figure came from but it strikes me that it may not it may not actually be saying that these people were exposed at a discrete point and then 30 days later started showing symptoms it, it may actually be a multi-day exposure that they had it As, it I, sense. I, I also think that uh, this is a um, paper published in October and as every as many people have said to us the data are very mm, slippery from this outbreak right yeah. it's difficult to pin down things so I'm not sure I would uh, hold this in such high esteem I would I would really uh, base my number on the previous outbreaks and, yeah. and, and the fact is nothing in this one should have changed the incubation period so I think going from what we know already previously is, is the way to go and that's what the 21 days is based on and we also have the control measures that as Rich said at the top of the episode are as we implement the control measures that we know about based on what we know about this virus including a 21 day incubation period um, that seems to be working so we don't have any cases that are like this yet, and I'm not entirely clear that these data disprove that. Yeah, so far there's been no problem using a 21-day incubation period as a as a, a good measure. All right, let's go on to some picks of the week. Alan, what do you have for us? Uh, let's see, what did I pick this week? Um, Oh yes, this is an article that I found. Uh, this this really resonated with me. Um, so uh, it's it's on a site called Medium that does a lot of uh, long form articles. So it's, you know, set aside a half hour to read this thing. Um, but uh, it it starts Alan, off. Alan, is it too long? Is it too long? No, it's just the right length. I'm just joking because you know. Twiv is too long for <laughs> yeah, some people. Twiv is, if, if you've got time to listen to Twiv, even on 2x speed, you've got time to read this article. Um, this fellow, a friend of his, died, and, and this set off a whole series of thoughts that he, that he writes about regarding the history of computing and how he experienced it, and he's pretty much of my generation. Um, and this, is, uh, the, this article is just straight out of my life. Um, and his his understanding and, and experience of that time period when when the Apple II came out and and everybody was playing around with these weird electronic devices and and learning how they worked. Um, there's there's a whole big population of us out there, and he and he goes and he emulates various systems and talks about the history of how all these threads fed together um, and gave us the the modern computing environment we have. I just found it a really interesting article. I really like this uh, bit, and I guess this is in chapters, right? Two out of ten. Yes, yeah, he did. He did ten chapters. Or he talks about it, this is uh, among other things, sort of a, an epitaph to his uh, friend Tom, who died at seventy-three after an illness, and he's got a picture of Tom here with the Dalai Lama, and uh, he says Tom's the guy on the left. Yes. As if, <laughs> as if you wouldn't recognize the Dalai Lama. It's great. This is really good for people who have have followed the development of computing because it's just got a lot of old screenshots and from different platforms. It's just really cool. So did I understand correctly that he can recreate some of these environments on his you own can, computer? You can emulate these on a modern computer. My and goodness. About that process. Yeah. Uh, you must have time to do this. Yes, he must, and uh, I, I've I've done a couple of a couple of times. I've when it was easy to do, I downloaded like an emulator for an Apple II Plus and ran it on my Intel Mac, and uh, just for the heck of it, um, just for old times' sake. One of these days, I had to get out some of Jeremy's old machines out of his closet and try and boot them up. All yeah, right, cool. you should you should do that right on the air here for right. us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might work better than the machine I'm on right now, which seems to be <laughs> crashing with regularity. Uh, Rich, what do you have for us? Okay, so you know Rosetta landed. What was the what was the lander called? This is the machine that chased the comet. I forget what the lander oh, yeah. was called. Uh, but basically, that all happened while Vincent was on the road. 
okay? So it didn't really make TWIV, which I'm sure kind of really hurt their publicity. Phil At any rate, during that whole thing, I was uh, messing around, and I found this site called Where is Rosetta, which is a an interactive from the European uh, Space Agency that I just booted, and so it's probably going to make noise in the background, um, that allows you to trace the entire voyage. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to turn it. Sorry. There is a way I can turn this off. There we go. Uh, it allows you to trace the uh, entire voyage of the spacecraft and how it rendezvoused with the comet. And it's interactive. You can pan in and out, and you can uh, uh, turn the solar system on its edge and that kind of stuff. And it's fascinating. This thing made four orbits of the sun before it actually intersected the comet and went uh, those orbits went outside the orbit of Mars and back inside the orbit of Earth and back outside the orbit of Mars again. And it looks like it's slingshotting around these planets in order to, I don't know if that's true or not, but in order to uh, warp its orbit into this super elliptical thing that winds up matching the orbit of the comet. Uh, and it's going to stay with it until it rounds the sun again. It was, um, I, I can't believe what these guys did. It's amazing. Yeah, it's very cool. Absolutely amazing. So check it out. That's a uh, at the actual uh, when it actually intersects it, it makes it all the way out to the uh, orbit of Jupiter and yeah. it's headed back towards the sun again. Now, unbelievable. All right, uh, my pick is also space oriented. Most of you have probably heard about the Antares Orb Three rocket explosion, which happened you know, uh, some time ago. Uh, but uh, some videos are now coming online from the professional photographers' cameras, the ones you've already seen have been mostly amateurs. And that's because they were only recently allowed to go in and get their cameras. They were so close to the uh, launch pad. And these are just spectacular videos of, you know, this rocket went up so much, not very far, and then it just exploded and came back down to Earth. It's a huge fireball. Uh, you know, it's a scientific experiment gone wrong, but when it does for space people, it goes wrong in a big way. So it's pretty. Uh, it, none of my experiments have blown up quite that spectacularly. <laughs> they felt like it, but, you know. Yeah. So check them out. There's, there are lots of versions of this, so I just picked one on YouTube. This is good. Uh, we have two listener picks. One is from Simon, who writes, Dear TWIV team, what a fantastic episode with Tom Solomon. While the Ebola episodes have been very interesting, it was great to take a break with something a little different. I've recently been listening to Relatively Prime, a set of Kickstarter-funded podcasts about mathematics. In episode four, the discussion is about how working on one problem can sometimes lead to very unexpected results or applications in another field. And there was a fascinating discussion about a novel approach to predicting influenza and other outbreaks. In brief, there's a phenomenon called the friendship paradox, which roughly says that most people have fewer friends than their friends have on average, which was first introduced in the excellently named paper, Why Your Friends Have More Friends Than You Do. <laughs> <laughs> I've always suspected this. Intuitively, this is because people with a lot of friends are more likely to be your friend and has been consistently observed in physical and online social networks. Nicholas Christakis from Yale University has since then used this phenomenon as an approach for forecasting contagious outbreaks within populations. The idea is that rather attempting to explicitly map a social network to identify the most highly connected individuals who will act as hubs for the spread of a disease, one can more simply use the friends of randomly selected individuals. By the friendship paradox, these individuals will be more highly connected. In a study from Harvard in 2009, they were able to predict a flu outbreak in the overall population by about two weeks. I don't know if any further work has been done on this or if it has ever gained popularity within the epidemiologi epidemiologist toolkit, do you? But I thought it was a really nice example of the way research in one area can sometimes lead to interesting applications in another. See the links below. He sends a bunch of links to uh, all of this. Thanks, and keep up the great work on Ebola and all things virology in general. I don't know much about this uh, penetrating more into the prediction space, but maybe some of our epidemiology uh, listeners can tell us about that. Yeah, this is cool. And our second pick is from Mark. Hello there, Twivosphere. It's raining here in San Jose, California. 
while you on the East Coast are being belted with cold weather and worse. Does yesterday's punishing five-plus feet snowfall in Buffalo, New York, make co-host Condit glad he now lives in Florida? Yes. That's a yes. All right. The year 2014 is coming to an end. For this listener, it has been a super year for TWIV and related shows TWIM and TWIP. It was great to have diversity of field trip visits to conferences and other researchers' labs. TWIV is a nice community. This year, we revisited old friends like flu, polio, and rabies while making new friends visiting with Ebola for several months. As the holidays approach, many think about gifts to give. Funding, finding a unique gift is a challenge. Here is something new. My nomination for Listener Pick of the Week is the site GiantMicrobes.com. They make doll-like replicas of viral and bacterial pathogens. These are great gifts to challenge a child's imagination and hopefully catalyze an interest in microbiology or give a scientist or physician. Products are inexpensive in the $10 to $15 range. Attached are screen grabs of their replicas of Giardia, rabies, polio, malaria, and 2014 surprise hit, Ebola virus. All the best, Mark. Didn't we break somebody's nose with uh, with rabies at the TWIV 300? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At TWIV 300, Mark, we threw some out into the audience. We oh. didn't actually break somebody's nose. We, I hit someone in the face, yeah. <laughs> I've got a bunch of these on my desk, so. Yeah. They are very I, uh, I use them as, uh, for, uh, as special effects when I lecture to the medical students. <laughs> Do you throw them out? Uh, I circulate them. I do not throw them out. Actually, the little tags on them that uh, explains what they are are not bad. They're uh, reasonably accurate. This whole thing has really grown. Yeah. This has grown into a big business. This site is extensive. I have one here. I got polio. Let's see if I can center it with the eyeballs. Where are we going here? Put it right in front of my nose. That'll make it. <laughs> oh. Oh. Right, let's try this again. Here. Polio. There you go. There go. Good, Vincent. All right. Yeah, but if we if we throw them again, we should definitely use norovirus. It's a better projectile. Good, Alan. Thank you. That'll be it for TWIV 313. You can find it at twiv.tv and over on iTunes. And if you want to ask us some questions, please do send them to TWIV at twiv.tv. We love to answer them. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thanks for joining us today, Rich. Sure enough, great time. Hope you had a good Thanksgiving. I did indeed. You too. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com, also on Twitter. Thanks, Alan. Always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. All right, let's see what we got for titles here, guys. With viruses like these, who needs animus? That's just really, really great. You know, but the other ones, Vini Virus Villi is great. Yeah. yeah. All you need are viruses, bacteria. We don't need no stinking bacteria, the kind that make you well. Oh, that last one is good too, right? Because it's a play on our channel. Yeah. I, I say it's either the first or the last one. What, what do you guys vote for? I, I like the first one. I really like the first one. It's good. Okay. With viruses like these, who needs enemas? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh.